Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Decoding AQ. I have a very good friend, Jason Slater, who's joining us today. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, it's great to see your face. For those that are watching this on YouTube, we'll see it as well. Um, but Jason, you are the head of financial management at Unido, yeah. uh, is your current guys uh, at Unido, because you We'll get into it a bit more of your journey, which, as I understand, is it 19 years today? or 19 maybe? years almost to the day, Ross, yes. Fantastic. Yeah. So why don't you give us just a, a little bit of background, because we first met actually when you were in a different role at Unido in the communications department, but mm -hmm. your time goes further back than that. So give us a little bit of your background from your, your, uh, your perspective of what's got you here. Sure, yeah, thank, thanks a lot, thanks for having me today. Um, yeah, my career started way back actually in the nuclear industry back in the UK. I spent near on nine years working in uh, mainly in the finance department there. And then I moved into a, a small, rel well, relatively small, I would say IT company, Norwegian based, um, as a management consultant. And I worked with them for three years. And one of mainly looking after uh, the public sector, um, basically helping organizations change in a way to introduce new business processes, predominantly around finance, logistics, HR, etc. And it just transpired that one of our clients was, um, was the UN, based here in Vienna. Um, I was always very keen to, to explore and to get, out, get myself outside of the UK. So I was asked if I would be interested to come and support them. So myself and three others joined joined the team here and we spent a couple of years basically commuting from Vienna myself back home um, and it was around the time as you may recall that the euro was being introduced so it was it's quite interesting that the UN at the time was one of the first to adopt the euro as its uh, actual reporting currency and that's the area that we supported them on so I came here yeah. I came here for a few years as a, as, as a management consultant as the UN as my client um, but then as a client, they approached me um, for various reasons and I, I decided to come for six months. And as you just mentioned, here we are 19 years down yep, the road. Two decades down the road. Having, you, shouldn't having, have been, you shouldn't have been that good, uh, Jason, and then maybe you wouldn't <laughs> have been approached. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so here we, are, here we are now 19 years down the road, having had a long journey through working in IT, being the head of, the, head of systems. Then a very, very interesting role after that, which was basically working and overseeing a huge implementation of um, a change management, but also uh, uh, implementing a, an, an ERP, an enterprise resource planning system, which 10 years ago was really the thing to do, yep. particularly in the UN. Yeah, huge a beast, beast of a project, I bet. Huge, in, yeah, yeah, we did. I was, I was responsible uh, for overseeing the largest integrated implementation of an ERP within the smallest budget and the tightest time frame. Um, and I'm proud to say that we at Unido succeeded on both of those. We did it on time and we did it considerably less than the resources that were given to us by our member states. But that, that led me into business transformation, change management. So it took me in a slightly different direction from the finance. Um, so I managed that. Uh, head of business transformation for, for three, four years. And then when myself and you uh, got introduced, I was requested to take on the role of head of communications, um, but with a very specific mandate, which was obviously was to expand, you know, um, your needles outreach. But that was at the time where, you know, digital transformation was just coming into its fore social media use of what you know how do you get yourself out there and tell a story on facebook twitter instagram further afield looking at china wechat vibo etc so extremely fascinating couple of years in my career one that i never anticipated but having now looked back understanding people like yourself more you know that um, rather than the numbers but also there's a story that needs to be told and that now brings me to where I am now, which is yeah, heading our financial management area here at Unido, which is primarily about 
support, providing financial management support to our 860 projects in 120 countries. Predominantly those are in very poor developing countries, which is about helping them with industrial development aligned to the global goals. So yeah, that's, that's my 19 years within a couple of minutes. Within the, within yeah. the company. I, you know, it's fascinating when you, when you look back and what is it that actually burnt on the mind? You know, what do you remember of these sort of key transitions or key events? And often it's so, when you're in it, it's just incredibly overwhelming mm. and equal levels of stress and excitement. But then when you look back and you see the achievements mm. of you and the organization of, you know, being able to take on such large projects with limited resources and still be alive at the end, you know, and still be smiling mm. is, is real testament to you as a, as a character, but also as an organization in what is possible when mm. given the ambition to do something and um, that they can do incredible things, uh, which is amazing. I mean, what was perhaps some of the, the hardest challenges in that big project that you mentioned um, of implementing an ERP piece? What were some of the highlight challenges that you, that you faced? The, the technical side of it was actually the area that became the most straightforward. The largest mm -hmm. challenge in that was the change management aspects of it. And that was, I think then we talk very much about cultural change, you know? Yep. You know, and we're talking about an era where certainly within the UN, I don't say in the private sector, where things like, you know, electronic approvals, workflow, four eyes principle, people being able to see, bringing a level of transparency to what, what people are actually doing in their, daily, in their daily work. So that for me was one of the biggest challenges. And from that was getting a, a level of engagement and understanding that that engagement yeah you know we say it's great you have top management support but it's got to be from top all the way down to those people who are actually the ones i would say really doing the you know the day-to-day -day tasks yeah. and work so that for me was be been one of the challenges that i would say getting it done on time within budgets that's heads down get on with it but yeah. you've got to have if people don't come along with you on that journey you're not going to succeed yeah and I'll be very open. I reflect on it now and look at lessons learned. The aftermath, the ripple effect of what we did back then, it took us two, three years to calm that situation down because yeah. you've brought a lot in very quickly. You've got people with you, but to really, really institutionalize that, that change that you brought about, it took quite some time. So I would say that was one of the, by far for me, and I think that is consistent throughout whatever you do. Yeah. The technology is there and yeah. you can embrace it. And some of us can, a handful of us. But if you want that to be something that's mainstream within your organization or within your company, then clearly the people aspect of it is, uh, is critical. It's a tough one. And it's yeah. that it is. For forming, storming and norming kind of process, isn't it? You know, and yeah. as you mentioned, the, the ripple effect on people that might I, do it through compliance, but then is it sustainable afterward of, of yeah. somebody? Does it become you know, the normal way of doing things. There. I, al I always say also, if I may just done this, mm. I always look at, if I look at myself, you know, I, I'd see my, my, my career has took mainly two aspects is there is the, the finance side and there is the IT. So, which is straightforward. There is money in money out. And yep. if it's IT, it's primarily binary, you know, yep. it's very straightforward, but there's a totally different aspect to it when it comes to people and managing and working with people, etc. So, uh, yeah. That, and that is the challenge. And it's also is. an interesting part of it as well. And I guess uh, from your experience of coming from binary, right, wrong stuff, you know, finance, yeah. IT, and then dealing with these strange beings that, you know, aren't binary, that have so many levels of complexity, mm -hmm. um, that what was wrong yesterday can be right today and vice versa, and just the mindsets, behaviors, beliefs, and then when you multiply that by each component of each mm -hmm. unit, each person bringing its own bit and then the dynamics of teams Absolutely. and organizations, yeah. it becomes a really complex, challenging beast to uh, deal yeah, with. Completely. And, and, and really underestimated, certainly back then, near on 10 years ago. And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't just talk about what we did here in Unido, but at the time, not, not very long after that, I became 
the chair of a UN-wide special interest group on so, you know, UNICEF, the Secretariat, all of the people had done this. And it was one of the, the biggest consensus that we came to is how on earth to get everybody aligned. I mean, today, and that's one of, you know, our own relationship that we've had over the last few years, people is much more at the floor look, looking at, you sit and say, have you got a team that's adaptable, for example? Yeah. It's not something you even came into your, it was not even on your radar 10 years ago. Change management, yeah, make sure that people are trained, make sure we adjust job description. A lot, but it still is on the technical side of it. The soft aspect, I think, was grossly underestimated. And, and that probably is why there was a huge, huge price tag. I can say openly that the figures are out there that, you know, the UN, when it implemented all of these large enterprise resource planning systems, invested over a billion. Mm -hmm. A billion. That is a phenomenal investment. Yeah. yeah that, the, the human aspect of it was something that was uh, grossly underplayed uh, throughout. But yeah, I we've, mean, learned. we've learned from that. We do. And I think that's the, that's the aspect of, you know, better forward. You know, that mm -hmm. when we re-engage on things is that we understand what do we leave behind and what do we yeah. take forward? You know, and the, yeah. the aspect of dealing with human beings and how this has now shaped your career of lots of these moments of where you as an individual has adapt, have adapted to new environments, new roles, new tasks, mm -hmm. new projects, new objectives. But then also your learnings of now from what might be easier to project manage, easier to deal with, you know, mm -hmm. of binary aspects to then the more complex of, of people. So how in terms of the organizations are preparing for the sort of pace of change so that project probably was a took a long time um you know and lots of projects historically take a long time to deal with the larger they are consequently it would be a long time to to mm. look at them mm. what we've been noticing is how so much pressure is to do more with less more with less resource mm. le you know less time to do those things mm. where are you seeing organizations either within unido or within your projects or clients that you're working with that's really doing that well at speed we have a few specific things that we are we are trying to do now around innovation i think you mm -hmm. but within the un itself is we have what is referred to as the the un innovation network which yep. is which is is also a very informal network it is those of us whatever level you are from managing to being the people who are being at the very detailed operational level, um, that you can join this to understand better how you can embrace certain innovation. And I think, as you just mentioned, is working together through a network, enabling you to move much faster than you'd ever done before, and also allow you to fail, but also fail very quickly so that you can then move on. And this is, this is a, di a totally different direction than what I have experienced in the past. You know, I mean, also breaking down silos of working with, you know, I'm now working now on a blockchain project. I know, I, and I always know that I can go to WFP, I can go to UNICEF, who are also two, three years down the line. They've been there, done it, they've took those risks, and they're prepared to share what they've done so that we can then advance at a much faster pace. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm seeing now is, is this, collaboration between us, you know, um, and taking risks with certain innovation to see whether it can work for you, you know, and if it can, how can you ensure that you do it with less resources? What does less resources mean? It means that you have to take risk and that you have to adapt yeah. to certain standard practices. Do I have to be so different? Does my, sorry if I give a quite a back office example, is my payroll so different in the UN than what's going on? Do I need to invest so much time, efforts and resources? Or do I start looking at how there are, you know, there are shared services out there that could even do yeah. that service for me. You yeah. know, there are things. SAS that, systems, technology exactly, systems. systems. All those yeah. kinds of things. It's yeah. a totally different way that we have to know look at the solutions that are in front of us mm. and because at this at the you know what is your function to do now particularly in finances the mass of data that we are collecting 
but we don't have the skills to, to drill the data, to analyze the data, to present the data in a way, actually back to the communication side of it, that tells a story, you yeah. know? So those are the things that I, I, I see. Um, I think there are some great examples out there. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I see what, you, what you know, UNICEF have been doing around the innovation. I, I was very, very lucky that last year, I was invited to the first ever UN Innovation Network bootcamp. You know, Unido presented its project. We learned a lot from it, but the people that I saw next to me, some of the examples of the, the tools that are being brought to developing countries, QR codes to help when, when you know, in, in, in Burkina Faso for UNFPA when, when children are born so that they have an identity, they have a digital identity. You might question, well, really do you want to give a baby a digital identity well it's it they have an identity now and what yeah. that then helps and all the subsequent services that they can receive these are some small but great examples that i have seen um i, I want to pick up on a couple of bits there so this this thinking of how to innovate faster is it looking with others collaborating with others yeah. so that we can learn from and so being open to share whereas historically Innovation was about gaining competitive advantage. You know, it was about yeah, building yeah. something internally that then your R and D was maximized for a commercial activity because nobody else knew it or what you were doing. Um, whereas I think now that's shifted a lot in terms of your advantage is to share more, to collaborate more. And when we talk about risk, the risk to take a new thing on and to innovate mm. is the equal risk of to do nothing. Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah. In a slow-moving world, to do nothing, the knock-on effect of that is delayed. Mm. In a fast-paced world, to do nothing is maybe an even higher risk uh, for organizations and, and, and teams well, and individuals. I, absolutely, absolutely. And, and yeah, to, you know, I have behind me the global goals, the 17 mm. global goals. And, you know, my organization's mandate is aligned very closely to SDG 9, Industrial Development. Inclusive, sustainable industrial development. But my favorite goal is number 17. Yep. Because 17, without that, without collaboration, without partnerships, without people accepting that you can step in and help others, um, I don't believe we've got any chance of achieving those or, or, even, or even just fulfilling our day jobs in the next one, two, three years. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a pace. I mean, I, we'll come on to it, but I can give you again some, some, some specific examples of this from my own experience as we go and, along. Yeah. And it's a different way of thinking, isn't it, from the traditional kind of transactional service. Here's a, here's a brief. Here's the, um, you know, exactly what I'm looking for. Can you meet those specs and we'll engage to a partnership that's orientated about, around mm -hmm. the result? This is what we're looking for, but we don't yet necessarily know how we're going to achieve it. Yeah. I remember the example of um, one of the first projects we were doing together, and it was a communications piece, and it was out to member states, and we were, you were looking at introducing VR uh, as a way to introduce uh, the opportunity for member states to see the real work that's going on in remote yeah. areas. Yeah. Uh, which traditionally was through photographs and text, be that in a brochure or a yeah, web. Brochure. Or yeah, yeah. And, you know, this sense of at the beginning, the sort of trepidation for breaking the norm, you know, then, oh, it's not a brochure or VR, isn't that something you experience at the circus? Mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, then having the courage to do it, put it in the hands mm -hmm. and eyes of some of the member states to then just be blown away with how much that engaged them to be connected to that story and emotionally that then led to, you know, positive outcomes, but it takes courage to do things differently. Right. Yeah. Abs yeah, absolutely. No, that was a, that's a very good example that you picked up on there. I mean, I, 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 I feel in that I was just a facilitator that I just allowed the team that I had around me to say, go ahead, take, take a risk. I believed in it. Yeah. Um, and it was with partnerships. Uh, it was. We worked with exactly. It, it was in partnership with the donor. It was with the European Union. They were the ones who actually provided some of the funding. Who took the risk and said, "Let's do community. Let's try this in a totally yeah. different way." We was working with one of the local universities here, Bayou, here in Vienna, um, and it, yeah, and with uh, also with the government of Armenia because 
that mm -hmm. specific uh, VR that we did actually with some local farmers. It was. Who had realized that, you know, just producing their own, the local produce, but if they came together more of as a conglomerate, that ultimately they could bring their goods to a wider distribution market, etc. And uh, no, it was a, it was a very interesting piece. And um, I think if we can just maybe just, it might be interesting for people to listen to this, to tell the full stories that, yeah. you know, from the project, from what we'd done, from what had been invested, we managed to show, film, see, and actually sit and be with those people that we've supported, seeing the outcomes, so see the delivery of the actual goods to where it goes from, from the farm in this particular case. And then bringing that all the way back into a very formal general conference like the UNGA setting of member states, of donors, et cetera. And then putting on them, putting on them goggles and some of those very member states then turning and saying, can we do this on our projects? This is such a fascinating way. I can feel, I can touch what's going on. I don't have to, yes, it's nice to have my brochure, et cetera, but to really be fully embraced. And if you, if you recall at the very end of it, we actually took it one step further and we organized for our member states to speak to the actual recipients of, of the support that had been given through our donor, the European Union, et cetera. It was, um, yeah. It was a great story. And I, it I is, it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I had two decades of, you know, brand and marketing stuff. I couldn't imagine that kind of result from somebody reading a brochure. You know, sometimes video, you know, really helps because you get that emotional connection of a storytelling for somebody going, ah, I now feel a relationship with that entity, that person, that company, that family, um, and I'd like to meet or connect. But the, the just the immersive nature of that mm. and for, you know, the, the UN for many who aren't inside the system, you know, see it in a different eye of whether it's advanced, not advanced, relevant, not relevant, but there's pockets of such innovation, such amazing work going on. Mm -hmm. And this challenge of being open to experimentation, being you know, um, aware of maybe these new skills and these new opportunities, whether that's software as a system or it's VR, or it's a technological piece, mm -hmm. or whether it's the way in which someone changed the ways they're thinking. I remember first introducing the concept of moonshot thinking um, to Unido and some of the executive leadership team there. And director, to the director general. Director general, oh, indeed. Yeah. I will still remember to the day our yeah. director general's quote, I want to be one of those crazy people. Exactly. You know, you know, I want and to take some risks. Yeah. So out of character, you know, I'd been led mm. to you know, uh, see this individual and this character through the eyes of the people that were around him. And uh, I, I often, you know, my, my bit here, you know, I, it's actually on my mouse mat and I'll read it out. And it, it says, one's destination is never a place, but a new way of seeing things. I go with my eyes wide open to unite, inspire and accelerate the best of all humanity. And so I, I remember thinking about that. OK, I'm going in with my eyes open with this particular character and um, it was a big risk you and I, I both was, took. I was more, <laughs> I think I, I was more nervous. Than you me. were probably more nervous. I mean, you had more to lose, I guess. You were inside there. I'm, yeah. I'm coming oh. in as, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I had a bit of, um, you know, history of knowing how it has affected other clients that we'd worked with in this particular fashion of driving innovation and the, the concept of moonshot thinking being, crazy until it's a breakthrough you know and a lot of this i got from peter diamandis and singularity university and all of these areas and introducing it into places where it's totally unexpected and it could have gone a few ways right it could have been i'm thrown out the room and you know we haven't talked again or it went thankfully in a way that's inspired i think not just you but many within your teams to have a different mindset, to think very differently about how to deal with change and mm. how to invoke the type of change they want. So mm. tell, tell us a little bit about your experience in Vienna of the crisis um, in terms of going to remote working uh, mm. as an organization and then coming back and how did the work that we were involved in, you know, of looking at adaptability, dealing with those things of the teams, how did that impact you and uh, your people in, in, 
in dealing with it? Yeah, no, yeah, we, we went into uh, lockdown on the 16th of March mm -hmm. um, here in, in, in Vienna. Um, it was done within a few, you know, literally Friday was notified by Monday you're working from home. Um, so to put that into context, uh, we have five and a half thousand UN workers here in, uh, in Vienna. We are in a compound and it's, you know, sealed off compound. It is a number of UN agencies, but of course... Uh, Describe just... it a little bit for people who've never been inside what that looks like. You know, you've got five and a half thousand. Yeah. And this doesn't look like your, um, you know, corporate environment. Not um, at all. So no. give us some, give no, us no. what it looks it's, like, it's... what it feels like. When okay, you're... yeah, yeah. We, 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 are, we all have our own, we all have our own offices. Uh, typically your offices and your windows uh, are almost attached as well to your seniority. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sit here with five windows, a slightly larger office than yeah. others. Most people. It's the, uh, the corner office with the windows that people. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. People fight for the corner one because on the corner one, you're allowed to actually request for our uh, logistical support to allow you to open the window. Wow. But yeah, this is a yeah. this is a building that is a series of. I don't know how to describe, but circular type buildings coming together. Yeah, sort of horseshoe. Central uh, uh, rotunda with everybody basically having their own office. So you're taking people five and a half thousand from in their own office and you know, your interaction in your office is a meeting. There's yeah. not a lot of, I it's am- Siloed meetings yeah, it is, and then it is, yeah. everybody yeah. together in terms of the cafeteria. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's more open plan. But yeah, in terms yeah. of the general offices is an office with a door, knock, bow as you go in, come and sit, you know, and, and have your meeting. There is, there is, there is a strong, we, we try and some of us more than others have tried. I know, I, I know even actually the days of implementing the UGRP, I, I decided to, to introduce open plan for the first time in, uh, in our organization. And, uh, and people were asking me, why are you sitting with your, with the, the, the implementing partner uh, project manager? I says, because if I'm, if I'm sat alone in my office, I don't know what he's doing and he doesn't know what I'm doing and we need to speak. And I, you know, I, so I think, but yeah, this was the, it's given us a, a visual of the environment. Yeah, so the call was, came yeah, in yeah. 16th. We're all working from home now. Yeah. Yep. One small last visual though, is all the elevators are bright, the, the most brightest orange you could ever imagine. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. We should wear sunglasses in the elevator. Yeah. Maybe my yellow glasses. glasses. Lockdown scenario. So, um, you, how are you going to get, you've got to, of course, adapt yourself in such a, such a way of how are we going to communicate the team with our clients? Our clients are being internal project managers, member states, et cetera. We would, this is the part, the, the part of the year, perhaps my least um, favorite part of the year, but anyway, we have to do it where we have to produce what we call banks, like statements for all of our member states, hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hundreds of them that are typically stamped, signed, officially sent to an embassy, going into things called pigeon also. Everything is about touch. It is people needing to speak, people needing to leave things. So we have gone from that environment to suddenly we are wherever we are in our apartments, our houses, whatever. We've got kids around and stuff. So we quickly put in place, actually within... 24 hours of the lockdown, we and the Department of Finance had issued a set of standard operating procedures so that wow. everybody had an understanding of how um, now you can operate. Was that adapted from existing or was that no. created from scratch? Scratch. Uh, from scratch. scratch. 24 hours. Here's yeah, our new SOPs. I mean, wow. you have your foundation and that have you, but we decided sure. because you asked me a question there, Ross, about how did we learn certain things about adapting? And there were certain elements that we quickly said, let's use this opportunity to leverage some change to allow ourselves, A, how we work to adapt, but also importantly, our stakeholders, how we interact with them. Mm -hmm. So we did do this. We took a few risks here and there. You could write some this, new rules. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this may not be something new to people who are listening in, mm -hmm. particularly private certainly, sector. Certainly was for you guys. Remember what I just said: official seal signatures. We moved to complete electronic communication with all of our member states and, our, and the embassies. 
we moved to something similar to a kind of a Dropbox type so that we were sending out statements where they could just pick them up. So official letters, statements, etc. So we moved so quickly into that environment. We suddenly, we needed to engage with our internal stakeholders. So obvious things, get Zoom up and running, yep. start scheduling briefing sessions, team, no longer communicate through formal email channels, telephone, etc. Move everything to you know social you know social media type um, yep. platforms, WhatsApp, right. Slack, whatever. Yep. So we quickly quickly moved into a different way of working, but also to keep ourselves engaged, also tracking what we were doing through COVID nineteen in the lockdown because you've also got to demonstrate your level of productivity. What is the impact, not just, so also measuring that, we, we quickly put that in place so that I can tell you now, I, it may not mean nothing to an external audience, but I know that my team was always doing 200 consistent tasks per week on certain areas, you know, wow. so I, yeah. I, you know, so we also managed to collect a lot of data. So very, very interesting period. And, and I have been back here now in the office uh, for near on uh, six weeks. What have I noticed? The benefit, two major things that I, we've managed to continue, and uh, I have to thank my, uh, my director for the, for the support on this, that all electronic communication we will maintain with our member states. Wow. That will remain. So it wasn't just a, uh, we have to do this because we can't do what we're used to. Yeah. You've now established a new and better way new, because of so this. In ours, the new normal, is a good normal Great. in certain areas. You know, when people yeah, yeah. refer to post, you know, post lockdown, this is, there are some very, very positive things. Yep. The way that we interact with our colleagues, I mean, now video conferencing, use of Zoom and other tools is now becoming by de facto the norm. And they're done at, much, at a much quicker pace than sitting in a, sitting in a meeting room for two, three hours. Yep. You know? Things are going and they're becoming much more we're becoming much more results orientated and what we want to get out of those interactions. So I think a, a lot of positive things so far have been coming out. Our overall productivity as an organization has also not been considering we are, a, we are an agency that relies heavily on traveling. And of course we're not traveling at the moment. Yeah. Our overall productivity is only 10% down on what it was 12 months ago. That is not so bad no. when you're heavily reliant on you know, a couple of hundred people getting on planes, going out there to the countries and implementing because they've all, they put in new techniques. Yeah. You know? Do you think that's given people a permission to think differently that it might be possible that maybe I don't need to go there. I might choose to for other mm. reasons to travel um, because uh, of an added benefit of being in the physical, but for many of the situations, mm -hmm it's not a required necessity if we can use technology to do that. And how many more things could we do? How many more people could we support That's if we're right. not in that downtime of the travel? And it's, all, it's also, it, it, I think also what we've moved into is an environment of, of much stronger trust. Trust with the people that are surround us, you know, to, uh, to empower them to do and to get on with certain things. So yep. in this instance now, you know, moving to introducing new tools so that our field operations can move much quicker, giving, you know, empowering them to, to do some of those things that you may well have relied upon in the past for somebody to fly in from Vienna or, or what have you. So, yeah, no, I, overall coming out of it, I feel for my own personal uh, area that I'm responsible for it, we've used it as an opportunity yeah. and to, to break certain things to change certain things and let that become in our eyes, the new normal in a positive yep. sense. Yeah. And, and, you know, when we see any event, whatever it is, good or bad to look at it as a, instead of happened to us, but happened for us mm. and that gift to be able to allow new invention, new reimagination mm. uh, of things. And mm. almost like, you know, it was very interesting. It was a small point, but, on the SOPs, you know, in terms of your operating procedures, did you adapt and amend what was there? Or did you say, no, we're going to start from scratch? What a difference that made in your thinking to yeah, say, we're yeah. only putting in things now with the lens of what is needed, not because it existed there before on paragraph what is, what 1B. Is what is critical now for your operations? What is essential? Yes. Strip out what's not. And wow, we, 
yeah, we, we could really maintain a level of not only productivity, but also bringing in certain innovation yeah. and not only we adapting as an organization, but our stakeholders. Yes. You know? Yeah. Member states having, I, I was having regular Zoom calls with member states to go through these statements that I've sent to them electronically. And they said, you know, very openly, when things come through the post and they go into, a, we are pigeonholes still, yeah, yeah. you know, there's still these, you might remember. I read about them, Jason, once. Little I read boxes. about them. Yeah, yeah. I saw it in a black and white film one yeah. time. These well, they're still here. And people don't go to those. You know, it, it, it's incredible. Small, small things here and there made a made a huge, huge positive impact. So yeah. And I think the the thing for our listeners to think about is where is your pigeonhole? You know, if we think about that as just a metaphor, that it's a a thing that was helpful yesterday, in a era before whether that's a particular piece of software you have, a particular process you have, or a particular mindset and belief that no, we can't collaborate with our competitor because they're our competitor. Um, you know, what difference would it make if we said, oh no, that's pigeonhole thinking, <laughs> you know, of posts yeah, yeah. going into there. Nobody uses that anymore. Mm. Um, how radically different would that be if we looked for a partnership that co-elevated? Mm. Was that before a sense of weakness and it was a sense of loss of control to now it's an opportunity mm. and then the only difference is the way we tell ourselves the story you know yeah, and our yeah. mindsets of approaching that yeah in terms of you know the kind of tips for you in your role and what you've done of embracing these you you've lived and breathed change programs for a long time mm. and you've built up incredible muscles of thinking of skills to be able to rally change, drive change, inspire change, ensure it's sustainable. Um, and often you can't see it in yourself. But the, this balance that I've observed of you between, you know, uh, absolute clarity and direction for people to then openness for collaboration of how they might solve something. Mm. And I think that's really strong leadership of the balance of knowing when somebody needs to go, no, there's a fire. The exit is this way. We're not going to collaborate and decide 10 different ways we're going out the building. We're going that way. Mm. And other times, ah, oh, there's a new thing here. We're going to look at inventing it and collaborate there. I think that's a one key aspect is knowing yeah. the different dynamics of leadership in different change environments yeah, yeah, and circumstances yeah. are important in terms of other tips that you might have of what you've seen in your own team or some of the you've talked lots about the member states or other organizations what things uh, would you recommend or suggest people could do to help them adapt in this new very fast-paced level of change when i look now what we are trying to achieve I haven't, we haven't even spoke about this bit yet, this project we started, is that I really believe that you've got to set yourself a clear vision. Mm -hmm. You have to have, we talk in with us, our moonshot. Yep. You've got to make sure that's beyond what you can touch. So it's something you really, really, really strive for. Get yourself on that. Get, you'll find quickly that when you have that, because it is something that is what most people will aspire to when you, when yep. you communicate. It has to be compelling. You really, you know, you, you, you gain momentum, you gain, a con you, you will have people that will want to join you on that journey. You know, we see that in most things when you, when you, mm -hmm. when you're looking at what people, when people set, set these aspirations and the people that join you, I, you've got to give them some trust. You've got to mm -hmm. give them some trust around you. You mentioned something before about giving a direction. You've got to do that as a leader, but it, you've got to also allow your team to embrace what is there. And the squiggly route to there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, you know, I once saw, I once somebody showed me something and they called it the root sphere, you know? And I, did, I had no clue. They showed this tree and these roots. And I thought, what is this? You know, we have processes and it goes like this. And the processes of, you know, they follow a certain sequence. And they said, a tree with its roots will always find a way. It will always find a way to grow. The, the difference is, where, how do you want that tree? Where do you want it to grow? You know, so that's the thing that I learned from that aspect is that, you know, 
you can tell people this is the direction and you go along it, but you will not necessarily succeed. And I think that gaining consensus and having a team around you that trust in their own ability, they can have a trust in you to guide them, but also in their team members, you can make a major, major difference. That's the thing that, that I feel that I would pass on to anybody is. And where we are going now with the level of change that's coming at us for what we could perhaps absorb, you have to do that collectively. Mm. You cannot sustain that on your own or even on your own in teams. You know, so that is, that is the thing that I, and, and you know, even today, one of, the, one of my moonshots that I talked about after I'd worked with you a few years ago, and when I came into finance, I kept that in my mind, and I mm -hmm. said, and I'm linking it back to member states and efficiency saving, and everything I said, my vision, my moonshot is, in four years, five years from now, my entire reporting to our member states is tokenized on blockchain. Now, started with that. Mm -hmm. Now, here today, we will hopefully, in the next one, two months, sign a partnership with some innovators from Germany, including the government. I don't pay for the software. It's open source because they want to collaborate with us. Exactly right. You know, so yeah. you know, giving very, very specific examples to, to what you're referring to yeah. about some of the things that you can, you find that by that collaboration that there are like-minded people who do want to step in, who do want to support you. My vision, I believe, will, I don't say will achieve fully four or five, but I'll still give it a go. Yeah. It's great to know now that not only within, my, within us here, within our ecosystem, that going outside, bringing in additional partners, they want to support. I said, how do we engage? How are we going to formalize this arrangement? Let's write a letter. You know, let's have a letter and we'll work together on it. So it's, it's so refreshing, isn't it? To um, a lot of organizations and companies have been look, looking at how do they exploit the assets they currently have? How do they increase the value time and curve for that? Which is different to what we're talking about here of imagining something that doesn't exist yet. And mm -hmm. then that becomes a magnet and a beacon for people who care about that same thing, who can come with their capability to the course. And that is a, you know, for some, it's a really enriching, energizing experience. Mm. But on the same side, for others, that's incredibly scary and different and difficult. You know, those that can do this imagination stuff that allows this collaboration that with just a letter, you can get going, whereas before... Yeah the amount of no, we need the specs, we need the protocol, we need everything lined up before we say yes. <laughs> um, how do those two worlds exist? Can they exist? Or do they need separate playgrounds, separate environments to thrive in a wider system of movement of all? What's your view on, on that kind of uh, structure and organizational structure for radical innovation? Okay, uh, this is... My, very much my own personal view is, is that I'm a, I'm a believer that in order to, you should allow innovation to thrive. You should, if, and I know this from experience, ERP, huge, bringing in an elephant, trying to get everybody on board. I said to you, three, four, five years, you're still working with it. I'm a great believer that if you can isolate and let something thrive, let it grow, almost take it as if it's a startup, even within your organization. Yeah. Let them not worry about the institutional structure, et cetera, and just give them that playground to work and to try and to see if something can. If it can, once you've piloted it, you look, you bring it in, can I scale it? How could I scale it? Let's maybe target one group of yeah. one team, one country, whatever. That's how I would see that you take this from the seed, let the seed grow, let it have the confidence dream of knowing big, that. Dream big, start small, yeah. and don't get het up about how to scale until you've even proved that the seed works. Yeah, don't, don't worry about yeah. that. Don't worry about like it. That. No, no, that's, that's, and that's, that's the conversation I had this morning when I ran a workshop with, 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 our, with our German counterparts. We agreed. Let's just work together closely, five people, that's it. 
Yeah. Then we go here, then we go here, and then yeah. eventually, you know, Builds that's that confidence. You know, yeah. you have the courage, small little teams, and it ripples out. I've got last couple of bits before yeah. we, we, we wrap up, and it kind of links to a lot of what we've been talking about. Of, I've been fascinated around innovation and adaptability for some time and what motivates different people to do that, to, to innovate, to adapt. Mm -hmm. In terms of you as an individual or whether it's your team or organization, what is it that's driving that motivation to, to innovate and adapt? What, what is it for you? I, I would say I can talk on, on behalf of most of my colleagues, friends, acquaintances within my environment is, um, for us, it's very clear that we want to make a difference. Um, and that difference is something that's far reaching and extremely positive. Um, you don't leave the private sector and management consultancy because you're joining the UN to have a career of becoming a CEO or whatever. You, you come here because, you know, you're with a bunch of like-minded people who really have certain things in their mind that they want to change. We, I have behind me the 17 goals, yeah. something that was adopted. These are the things that motivate us. These are the things that we strive towards as individuals, as teams, as an organization. Outside of the organization, we see that there are people also have that same drive. We're moving, I hope we're moving into a, a, a way of thinking in terms of more sustainable. We have to rethink even our economic models. We've seen that yeah. after what's going on in COVID-19. We have to rethink, we, that's, I mean, we... The collective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how can, and interestingly, you know that you think you may want to make a difference, particularly within the UN environment, but then you start reaching out to the private sector. There's a common theme across, and I yeah. think we all have that now, that we've all reached a point now where we want to leverage what is there, whether it be through innovation or our ability to adapt, but actually we're striving for a common goal. Really, that's what I see at the moment. Yeah. And it's we the have moonshots. This... It's the global goals. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The it is. That and, innovation and, and adapting are the, just the roots. And and we might, the not, we, we might not achieve those by 2030, but I still think it's like a moonshot. It might be that yeah. we were shooting for 2050, but we'll be a damn way along the line by 2030 to making yeah. and putting in place a lot of those changes for the next generations that are coming, you know. They, that we've moved the needle yeah exactly yeah. but significant on the things that matter significantly yeah, yeah that's, hopefully that's great and in terms of um anyone who's who's listening who hasn't come across unido's work but they might be in their networks in their connections that thinking oh i'm curious about that of what is it you actually do of supporting these you know developing countries that are evolving their industrial models and you mentioned about the farmer you know the uh, cheese farmers and things and helping them scale um how can people engage with unido that might never have done something like that uh, but are now curious maybe a little bit interested what's the route in uh, if any of our audience are curious to find out more what's the best way and i want a better answer uh, jason than just visit our website is there a specific bit in there that you can navigate with insider knowledge of where this is where you might need to start to see if it's relevant and there might be an opportunity sure yeah i mean yeah beyond visiting our website yeah that's the traditional um, answer but no we well we actually do have a partnership team we have right. a partnership team that is yep. actually in place. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming most of the audience out there may be coming from being startups, entrepreneurs, working in the private sector, et cetera. Mm -hmm. we, we have a partnership team in place that can explain how you can get yourself involved with us as an organization. And not only looking at to work with us in industrial development in terms of, you know, you come and work along our side, but how we can then put you in contact as well with our beneficiaries that you might want to provide some support to you There's know a, there is um, amazing capabilities in there of years and years worth of data and statistics i re remember getting these yeah, big yeah. fat annual yeah. uh, statistic you know books that you guys have been keeping for years and years and years and all of these things that exist whether it's capabilities connections member states there's a wealth 
of opportunity in there. It just takes some curiosity to go and have conversations and go and discover. Yeah, and absolutely. from my experience, you know, uh, the collaborations, the removal of some of the red tape and barriers, if you find the right people, you can get some stuff done. Uh, and that's exciting. We have, we have, Ross, we have some very, very exciting partnerships that we've had in place with people in the private sector. You'd be very surprised from working with Volvo for a number of years, working yeah. with Hewlett Packard, working with Illy Cafe in all different types of areas and what have you from at different levels. And, uh, you know, our role here as, as a specialized agency is, it's ultimately about creation of jobs, I would yeah. say green jobs so it's looking at doing things in a different way because yeah. industrialization can have some very negative connotations to those of us certainly people like myself born in manchester from yeah. the first you know it's a different it's a different world that we're operating in now and that's so working with contacting us reaching out to myself for example i'm more than happy to pass on anybody uh, to it to our partnerships team and they can give you some very specific uh, ways that you can either right. work with us or not, but we can put you in contact with people in those countries that you may feel that you want to help and pass on some of your own expertise and your own knowledge that can help them yeah. ultimately. I think, you know, yeah. the mandate, just to wrap it up, of creating jobs, there is a future of a huge requirement of that as Absolutely. we all are transforming and transitioning where we need reskilling and upskilling to an entirely different world. And every industry, every organization is going to be feeling that pressure of the restructuring yeah. and how do they shift yeah. that. Yeah. And um, from my own personal experience uh, of the, the UN, how I saw it before I went inside was different to then going inside. And if I can encourage people to uh, relook and help reimagine and under the guise of, of partnerships, I'm certainly looking forward to ours continuing, Jason. And... Yeah you know, some great things can be achieved. And if we move the needle, uh, you know, each person just a little bit, the end result will be significant. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ross. Thank you. Bye-bye. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalised report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQAI transforming the way people, teams and organisations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.